Alô, é... Bom dia a todos. Obrigado por estar presente no nosso segundo dia do evento. Good morning for all. Thank you for joining us today in the second day of the event. É... It's an honor for me to introduce Professor Patricia Put uh, from University of Perugia, Italy. She will talk about uh, the tour on sublevel type inequality in the Heisenberg group and the application to critical sub elliptic problem. Professor Patricia Put, she has many outstanding papers, mainly about uniqueness, existence, multiplicity, and non-existence results for many problems. Uh, but uh, the, I would like to mention uh, outstanding paper uh, about maximum principle. Uh, the title is uh, Put Serial Maximum Principle. Now it is a uh, book by Springer. Welcome, Professor Patrizzi. Thank you very much for the introduction, for the invitation, which made me very happy. And uh, I thank all the scientific uh, uh, committee and uh, naturally the local committee that was uh, so kind to me. It's for me a great pleasure to be in this uh, workshop online for the second time, and uh, for the second time in Brazil, even if uh, online. Thank you very much. So uh, the title uh, contains uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, the, the, the main difference between the uh, uh, Euclidean case and the Eisenberg group are uh, um, very much uh, uh, evident. I will uh, uh, just say a few words about that. Uh, so this Eisenberg group is a lead group uh, under the underlying manifold uh, whose dimension is uh, 2n plus 1. And uh, so uh, is uh, defined in this way and uh, naturally as uh, a non-abelian group law given in this uh, form where uh, xi and xi prime are in hn and uh, naturally are uh, uh, these uh, uh, couples as i said so with uh, o i denote uh, the identity element uh, in hn uh, with uh, these uh, two components and uh, the inverse in this group is uh, just a minus uh, xi so the Eisen group uh, is a very simple case uh, of a sub-Riemannian manifold and not a Riemannian. So to understand uh, this uh, is just to give a distribution of plates and then uh, uh, this is smooth uh, uh, assign uh, this, uh, uh, at each point of the plane. In this uh, case, uh, when uh, the dimension is uh, H1, uh, that means a, a a distribution on R3. And so there are uh, these uh, admissible curve uh, so that uh, for each two points, uh, there is a, a curve uh, join them. And so uh, you can introduce uh, the famous distance uh, called the Carateo de Ricarno distance uh, given by this infimum, which is uh, fairly natural. But the topological dimension that uh, we, uh, we emphasize is uh, 2n plus 1 is strictly less than homogeneous dimension Q, which is 2n plus 2, and we will see how to enter. And this is uh, the unit uh, uh, ball of H1 lose uh, convexity, as you see. So uh, very interesting uh, uh, respect to the... Uh, Caratteo de Ricarno distance is uh, the uh, Coriani uh, distance. So the Coriani norm plays uh, a, a very uh, key role in all uh, the main inequalities. The distance is given in this form uh, in uh, connection with uh, the norm R, as you can imagine. And you see 
And the difference between Z, uh, which is in R2N, and the time T, which is uh, how it plays. Okay, um, the distance uh, acts, as you see, as an Euclidean distance in the horizontal direction, which is the Z direction. It behaves in very different in the missing direction, as we shall see. Okay, what is important are the, the, that the, this is invariant um, under translation uh, to eta and uh, under uh, is homogeneous of degree one, as is clear, uh, with respect to the family of uh, dilations that are, which are given in this uh, form. Uh, so uh, what uh, um, is important is uh, this uh, relation which gives uh, the homogeneity. Oh, so what is uh, the Jacobian, the determinant uh, Jacobian of uh, the dilation? is a constant and it is equal to dilation with r positive is equal to r to the power 2n plus 2 and 2n plus 2 is the natural number which is denoted in literature by capital q and is called the homogeneous dimension of the Heisenberg group naturally is a lee uh, Algebra is generated by the vector fields I wrote here and uh, with the canonical commutation relation. And this is uh, the horizontal gradient, which is expressed by the uh, first 2n components of the basis. And so uh, this is uh, the, uh, the norm, the horizontal uh, norm. And then uh, there is uh, the horizontal Laplacian, uh, which is uh, given in terms of the first two n components of the basis, but as you see, involves, uh, this is the main difficult, also the two n plus one dimension t. Um, so this is uh, this operator is a sublytic, the name was given by Ormander. And, uh, and of course, uh, this is the case P equal to, but can be generalized by the so-called horizontal P Laplacian, which is uh, given in terms, uh, as usual, of the divergence in this uh, uh, to n space along a, a test function phi. Okay, this is uh, the von Stein inequality the main Fonenstein inequality and the critical exponent P star is given in terms of the most important dimension connected with the Heisenberg group, that is the homogeneous dimension. And so uh, along the uh, regular function, uh, we have this uh, fallen Stein inequality, fairly naturally, with uh, the best uh, uh, constant. Okay, uh, naturally, uh, this uh, fallen Stein inequality can also be given in this uh, uh, so horizontal Sobolev space uh, with uh, the standard norm. And uh, of course, the open set omega can be replaced by the entire uh, Heisenberg group, uh, so that uh, uh, this is uh, the standard notation also in the, as uh, in the Euclidean case. And uh, what is uh, evident is the same uh, proof uh, thanks to the uh, dilation. It's evident that uh, uh, if this inequality holds, then the Lebesgue exponent uh, Q must be exactly P star, also in this case. Okay, uh, what is uh, an open question is uh, the uh, sharp constant. So in the Heisenberg group, this is uh, still an open problem. And so this is uh, the first uh, uh, difference. Uh, I will say briefly that in the Euclidean space uh, and is well known, of course, the sharp constant in the Sobolev inequality, thanks to Talentio Ben, 
and the proof relies on the radial increase the range you start and uh, this uh, can be done also in the Eisenberg group. This is uh, the standard rearrangement in the Euclidean case, uh, which is given also a natural measure uh, on the level. And then uh, we have uh, the celebrated polyazego inequality uh, that uh, says that if U is in the Sobolev space, then uh, the non-increase rearrangement U star uh, does not exceed the P norm and uh, the P norm of the gradient is less than the P norm of the gradient of U. And so that in particular U star is in the Sobolev space. Well, this uh, inequality is uh, used to prove the relic father kahn inequality. And uh, what is important is that gives you the optimal constant in the Sobolev inequality in RN. Okay, uh, this is so the Euclidean case. Uh, this is the proof of uh, Talenti. Uh, this, the, this ratio attains the maximum, increasing, attains the maximum in the star. Okay. But uh, you start, uh, as I said before, uh, can actually be generalized. But what is an open problem in the context of the Eisenberg group is that it's not known whether or not the LP norm of the horizontal gradient of the rearrangement of function is dominated by the LP norm of the horizontal gradient of the function. So, in other words, the poly inequality uh, uh, with the horizontal gradient in the Eisen group is not available. Okay, there are uh, several recent contributions uh, proved uh, by this uh, famous uh, paper, but my friend is very uh, serious, and uh, they proved that the, the uh, polyazegu inequality holds in the context of the Eisenberg group for any p greater equal than one, but there is a constant c depending on p greater equal than one in which this holds. So uh, with the p equal one uh, uh, is uh, this uh, old famous paper of Jerison and Lee, uh, which is uh, true uh, only in the case p equal to. So, this is uh, the proof of the zero inequality in Aren, and uh, this is uh, uh, the main difficulty. Uh, this inequality was proved by Pansu, but the, uh, the main open problem is uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, the best constant of this uh, configuration is unknown. Ecco, there is a conjecture of Pansu, uh, but uh, this. Uh, uh, bubble are, uh, is uh, just a conjunction. Just to see um, in this uh, configuration, this is a marvelous picture given in this uh, monograph, a recent monograph. So this is uh, the, um, the figure you see from the above. Uh, this is, uh, you take a, a length from the South Pole to the North Pole, and um, this uh, a curve, you make the envelope and you find this ball in H1. This is the bubble uh, in the Eisenberg group. Okay, so as I said, uh, the sharp constant is unknown. So in particular, uh, the best uh, constant in the Follenstein inequality, or P, uh, uh, was found only for P equal to. And not, uh, and, and not in other case. And this is the famous paper, as I said, this is the constant when P is equal to, uh, with all the situation which can be proved with uh, uh, some difficulties, of course, uh, usually dilation and left uh, translation, um, in this uh, in, in almost the same. But, uh, as I said, the natural question is, uh, what is uh, the best constant in Fallenstein inequality for all p different than 2? 
And what is the border case when P is exactly the homogeneous dimension? Okay, um, the, the first question, as I said, is still open. And the second question was uh, answered in this uh, famous paper by Bonnelli. Okay, uh, so uh, this is uh, the main things uh, I would like to say. This is uh, the minimizer is proved that we are the concentration compactness uh, uh, principle of myons as uh, usual. And uh, this is uh, uh, the natural uh, space for the solution is uh, the Follenstein space, which is denoted in literature by S1PHN which is the completion of uh, the test function with uh, this norm. Okay, so uh, what uh, was uh, proved uh, that uh, by Ivanov and Vasilev uh, recently is that uh, this uh, variational problem uh, as uh, this uh, uh, the infimum is achieved in uh, this uh, non-negative function U, which is a weak solution of uh, the critical uh, equation in H. Okay, so the main difficult uh, for uh, finding the minimizer stems uh, from the fact that, that clearly the Sobolev uh, uh, embedding is not uh, compact, and um, uh, there is a not compact uh, group of dilation preserving the set of extremes. The concentration principle of Lyons can be applied to prove that uh, the best constant embedding is, is achieved, but is not explicitly uh, not, uh, not known uh, the explicit uh, form of the best constant. So there are several difficulties. And so what happens in the border case P equal Q, and so in the Euclidean uh, case, uh, the, we are the same, uh, uh, there is uh, this uh, exponent integrability, there is a uh, that is uh, this uh, refinement uh, given by Trudinger Moser. What is interesting is that the first proof was given by Trudinger, but Moser gave uh, later on, uh, shortly later, uh, a different proof. And the proof of Moser uh, can allow to give the sharp constant. Uh, so in... Uh, uh, there are, I made here, there is this great contribution by the O, uh, Kao and Akashi and Tanaka, and uh, so uh, for uh, this situation. So this is uh, the Trudinger Moser, just I, I go very quickly. Uh, and as you see, when omega is bounded in Rn, uh, then the uh, the treasure alpha n, which is a sharp, is uh, uh, can be uh, covered. I mean, alpha can be less or equal alpha n. And uh, as I said, alpha n is sharp. In the, the uh, entire space Rn, of course, uh, the Trudinger Moser inequality takes this form. And uh, as you see in this case, uh, alpha is strictly less than alpha n. Okay? So the case alpha n is, uh, is not uh, taken. And actually the inequality is false if alpha is greater or equal alpha n. And so in, the, uh, in this case, uh, alpha n cannot be reached. Okay, uh, in bounding domains uh, of the Eisenberg group, uh, the Trudinger Moser inequality was obtained in this uh, celebrated paper, uh, in which uh, an idea of Adams in deriving the Moser Trudinger inequality uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, used. Uh, in which uh, this idea of Adams evolved the to 
consider the horizontal gradient of the re rearrangement function. This is uh, the main key issue. The situation is uh, more complicated when uh, we are in unbounded domains uh, in the Eisenberg group uh, and uh, uh, the Adams approach does not work. So this is a very recent paper by Lam Lu Tang and obtaining a, a sharp pluridimensional inequality in the entire. And here I uh, repeated, so there is uh, this alpha uh, Q and uh, there is also, a, as you remember, this is uh, the Koreani norm, so this is a type of RD uh, weight and uh, so it's a very general situation. There are uh, several uh, contributions, and I cannot uh, uh, give uh, all the contribution in the subject, but this is a, a very interesting uh, problem. So, uh, for uh, the sub-elliptic uh, situation, when uh, we consider operator with you no know, standard uh, growth, and uh, uh, we that were introduced in the different situations independently by Zico and Marcellini. And uh, uh, we are interested in the entire solution critical inequality. So uh, there is a, a type of uh, uh, several lack of compactness arise for different reasons. So uh, the model problem I start with uh, is uh, the PQ uh, problem. Uh, and F, I already gave this, and F is, uh, and F uh, is a critical in, uh, in the sense we will uh, see uh, below. And uh, we consider two different cases where uh, Q is strictly less than uh, the dimension, the homogeneous dimension, and when Q is equal as uh, we said before. Oh, in this uh, first paper, uh, we uh, took a system uh, which is uh, quasi linear. Uh, and the prototype is uh, the one I gave you. And uh, the fact in the system is clear that uh, alpha and beta are greater than one, and uh, alpha plus beta is a Q star, which is uh, uh, the critical exponent uh, in terms of the big uh, exponent uh, Q. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first time which appears this uh, fact that you can reach Q star, which, uh, for instance, when you use Orlich space, usually in the paper they reach P star. So in our treatment that started with Fischella, uh, we, uh, we, do, we arrive until uh, Q star, which is uh, a new fact, a completely new fact. Uh, I said that this was already my paper uh, in the Euclidean case, and uh, there are also other papers in, in this situation. I don't enter too much in the subject, uh, in the details and the proof. Uh, naturally, A uh, is... Uh, a very famous uh, operator in the, the so-called Trudinger, uh, uh, Trudinger uh, Gilbert Trudinger book, uh, the A operator, which are very famous in literature, and B is uh, strongly related, but not so strongly uh, uh, the fact. So we are able to cover very different situations. Of course, we cover uh, the uh, uh, the case. F is uh, uh, subcritical and uh, uh, is a standard assumption in the context of variational problems. And uh, so I just uh, give a few examples. So when uh, A and B are equal, uh, which are the potential, uh, you get exactly the prototype model. But you can take A of this form and you see that B is a completely different form. So a type of a very interesting uh, um, uh, argument in the proof must be uh, 
uh, used because uh, the two growth uh, can be different because C can be zero. Okay, and so here you take the main curvature and, uh, and B is completely different. Uh, you take the operator, I, we introduce uh, with James Serrin, uh, very exotic operators, and uh, you find uh, this, uh, this part. So uh, it's a very, very general. And uh, we prove that in this uh, uh, paper the existence of a non trivial solution with both components non trivial, provided the the parameter lambda is sufficiently large. The, as I said, the problem is variational. Um, we prove the existence via a mounting pass theorem. So the levels are constructed thanks to geometry of the problem, which is a fairly uh, standard in this situation when the parameter approaches infinity, this uh, mounting pass levels in lambda approach zero. Uh, this, uh, allow to, uh, to prove that uh, uh, the uh, Pelesmel sequence you find uh, approaches uh, a weak limit, and the weak limit, uh, this is uh, the key part, uh, is a weak solution provided lambda is greater than equal to lambda star. And um, this is a, a need a new concentration compactness principle a la Lyons, and uh, in this uh, uh, Follenstein space. Okay, uh, this is, uh, I do not enter too much in the detail. With uh, my uh, current PhD student, again, uh, we used, uh, we arrived in the case in which a small Q coincides with uh, the homogeneous dimension, capital Q. So we need, uh, as I said before, a moser trudinger inequality, and uh, the sub uh, is uh, this uh, term uh, as uh, an, um, uh, an exponential growth, uh, F as exponential growth, and involves also a, a the coefficient, which is uh, uh, of the hardy type. So there are several uh, problems with uh, this, uh, uh, this exponential. I gave uh, just a few examples, uh, and I remind uh, to the literature. What is uh, uh, fairly new is uh, this uh, general growth on F, uh, and uh, very general, and again, in this case, we are able to prove that if this perturbation, which is in the dual space, so it's very general perturbation, is sufficiently small, but positive, uh, but I mean, uh, the norm is positive, strictly positive, is not zero, uh, then uh, it's possible to prove and the existence of a non-negative solution again. And this is a fairly delicate the situation and can be uh, also uh, improved in, in other uh, contexts, uh, for instance, in the fractional context of the Eisenberg group. Okay, in this uh, paper dedicated to uh, this uh, special volume, uh, we consider uh, in the scalar case, an equation, and uh, here P is strictly less than the homogeneous dimension of the Eisenberg group, but uh, uh, Q, uh, which is a subcritical because this term is critical, can be P or strictly bigger than P. So this is uh, uh, naturally in this context, star is exactly this. Oh, so uh, we have uh, to distinguish two situations, <coughs> the case in which <coughs> Q is clearly bigger than P, and the case in, in which Q is equal to P. On the weight, uh, on the, the weight uh, uh, W, uh, we assume uh, simply 
uh, that uh, is in L1 lock uh, and that the invading uh, of the uh, Follenstein space into this uh, weighted uh, bag space is uh, compact. And then uh, on um, the coefficient uh, uh, k of uh, the critical part, we assume uh, simply that is positive in an infinity bounding and uh, approach k infinity at uh, infinity when uh, the norm approach infinity. Okay, and again, in this uh, contest, uh, we are able to prove the existence of uh, a non trivial uh, solution, uh, um, non um, provided. Uh, the, there is a treasure, uh, greater equal, and uh, this uh, theorem extends the previous theorem of mine, uh, obtained uh, with the different uh, quarters uh, and different PhD students. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is uh, the case, as I said, uh, uh, Q uh, bigger than uh, the one. So the theorem is obtained in with an application of the compartment principle, which uh, I already uh, cited. We give in this, uh, in this paper, in this paper, which is uh, dedicated to the memory of uh, Professor Peral. Uh, this, uh, the second case is uh, more challenging and uh, was not uh, treated in my previous paper and uh, takes uh, a strong inspiration of uh, this paper of uh, Baudet, Santier, Silva. Uh, and in this case, uh, as uh, we recall, uh, the coefficient k of the critical part is one, and uh, the, uh, the weight uh, uh, w is uh, in an infinity and there is a point uh, such that uh, the weight is strictly positive. Okay, uh, so uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, to assume that P is greater than one, but P square is less than capital Q. And so uh, under this uh, assumption, uh, there is uh, a solution provided now the parameter lambda is between uh, zero and lambda one when lambda one is given uh, in this uh, form. Okay, uh, the theorem uh, goes back to this uh, seminal uh, paper and uh, is a uh, we have an, uh, the proof must be adapted, and uh, we have to uh, use this uh, uh, extremal of the Follenstein embedding, which is uh, given in this form uh, when asymptotically, when the norm, the Coriani norm, approaches infinity. And uh, what is uh, important, uh, in fact, uh, here is that. Uh, the request that the P square is strictly less than capital Q uh, gives uh, that uh, uh, this uh, extremal capital U is in LPHN, which is uh, a very important uh, uh, fact. Uh, recently, I gave a short co communication in uh, this uh, paper, but in bounded domains, uh, when uh, there is uh, a, a Kirchhoff coefficient, and, uh, and these are uh, situation delicate because of the presence uh, of these terms. And we are able to prove in this natural assumption in the variational context, but in the case in which the Kirchhoff coefficient in the problem and the underlying problem is non-degenerate, that means the Kirchhoff function is strictly positive and uh, far from zero, uh, a multiplicity result. And uh, this is uh, uh, related to uh, similar uh, systems 
studied uh, recently by these authors uh, in uh, Arendt. And uh, as I said, in this uh, paper, uh, we prove uh, uh, we prove uh, this uh, this uh, theorem uh, and is ex a multiplicity result. And uh, uh, as uh, Garofalo and Lanconelli used to say in, this, uh, in their seminal papers, uh, I cited just the one. Uh, even if uh, uh, there are uh, several uh, similar properties between the con Laplacian operator and the classical Laplacian, the similarity may be misleading. So the proof are uh, really different. And this is the multiplicity result, I, I said. Now I have a visiting a visitor from China, and uh, we extended the paper, uh, just in a paper just admitted, uh, covering uh, the case where M can be, uh, the problem can be singular, that means M0 zero at 0 can be 0, that, uh, which is a very interesting application. And, uh, and when uh, there is also a logarithmic term. Uh, and so uh, using... Uh, a very natural condition I introduce for kickoff problem, which cover uh, the, uh, the classical uh, prototype given by uh, Kirchhoff it's himself, uh, and uh, in which A can be zero, and uh, so that uh, the problem is uh, critical, and so that this assumption are uh, fairly natural. And uh, so, uh, again, uh, we are able to prove existence of solution, provided that this uh, parameter, mu, uh, is less than this uh, threshold, uh, where S is uh, the critical, uh, the sublet uh, constant given in this form. And so these uh, are uh, several uh, uh, technical difficulties because of the logarithmic term, the, the presence of the uh, criticality in this uh, context, and uh, the fact that uh, the problem uh, is, uh, can be degenerate because uh, M0 is uh, zero, can cover this case. So I thank you very much. I am obrigada for estar conmigo uh, very much. <laughs> thank you for your attending, and I hope uh, um, my time uh, is not, I, I used, uh, I, did, I did not use too much time, okay. It's okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for a uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm going to uh, see if he has some questions or remarks. Uh, Patricia, uh, is there any uh, uh, fractional version of this operator? I don't understand, yeah. sorry. What is, it? Uh, is there uh, uh, a version of a fraction, fractional, fractional operator? Yes, there is a, a version of the uh, fractional in this uh, context. And mm. uh, we actually did not, uh, 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 we, we, we did not work uh, so much in this uh, direction. We, we stay a little because it's a very complicated, the fractional case. Yes. So I do not have any contribution at the moment. I prefer mm. to stay in Aren because uh, uh, the difficulties are, uh, several difficulties arise. So I have a contribution with the Temperini, but uh, in the Euclidean case in Aren, not in the HM. I have another curiosity. Uh, because, uh, uh, let me see, maybe, um, uh, I I gave uh, since the things to say were so many. I tried uh, to uh, 
I don't find any more. Yes, but. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Maybe, uh, okay. Uh, this is uh, the way you see. Ah, uh, yes, yes. This is uh, the definition. I, yeah. I went very fast uh, on uh, this uh, slide because I was afraid uh, to use uh, too much of my time. And uh, you see, this is the uh, P. Uh, yes. So this is the fractional S. Yes, yes. yes. This yeah. is uh, the definition. So mm -hmm. as you see, this is uh, the Coriani norm, which involves uh, the dilation. Yes. And uh, this is uh, the exponent. Mm -hmm. So formally, this is uh, the, uh, the, the, the operator the yes. fractional operator, but uh, it's fairly, fairly difficult to, to work with. Uh, another curiosity. Uh, 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 these, uh, these, all these papers I cited here, mm. all these papers I cited here are in RN, not in yeah. HN. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, this, this, uh, okay, okay. Uh, is there a, a problem like a hey, no problem uh, putting the this Korean Korean norm not below but above it? It's possible to study, yes, yes, mm. certainly. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, you you can have a weight mm -hmm. which is uh, in terms of the Koreani norm. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, so you can ask also for uh, uh, some symmetry. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Let's see if some. So, for instance, when X uh, is uh, is given terms of R of C, so you have a radiality. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of the Eisenberg group. Yeah. Let's see. Has some question here? No. Okay. Thank you very much for <coughs> giving talk for us. Once more, <laughs> I hope to see you personally. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. I never was in Brazil, so <laughs> yeah. it's a, a huge country, Brazil. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for all. I, I invited the audience for for the next talk in 15 minutes.
Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Let's let's continue for uh, this morning session with his second talk. It's an honor for me to introduce Professor Denis Bonnier from Brussels University, Belgium. He will talk about a sharp gradient estimate in the W2Q regularity for the prescribed mean curvature equation in the Lorentz Minkowski space. Professor Denis, uh, he, he, uh, is a, he has a many outstanding paper, uh, many about concentration, compactness, regularity, bifurcation theory, system, etc. But uh, I would like to mention a remarkable paper uh, uh, right, uh, in collaboration with Edison Santos and the Ramos uh, Tavares uh, about the existence of uh, symmetric, symmetry in, uh, of least energy nodal solution for Hamiltonian system. Uh, welcome, Professor Denis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So it's a, a great pleasure to be with you. I'm uh, a bit sad not to be there in San Carlos. Uh, I hope pandemic is going to end at least. We could come back and have our summer meeting there. So uh, thanks to the organizer for this uh, nice conference. And uh, uh, let's let's start. So I'm going to discuss today uh, some uh, result I got in collaboration mainly with uh, Alessandro Jacopetti, who is now a researcher in uh, Torino. And uh, it's about the prescribed mean curvature equation in the Lorentz Minkowski space. And it's about uh, uh, regularity. So uh, I will, in, in fact, there is, a, there is a small link, quite small, but still a link with the, the lecture of uh, David Arcoya, who told, has been talking yesterday about uh, um, this uh, relativistic pendulum equation. And, it's kind of the same uh, family of equation. OK, so here is the, 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 the plan of my, of my talk. I'm going first to discuss a little bit about what I mean by mean curvature in the Minkowski space. So uh, let me start with a, a quotation from a paper by Bartnik and Simon saying that uh, finding um, let's say a maximal or constant mean curvature hypersurfaces is a, an important issue in uh, classical relativity. And uh, so let's say a motivation could be from physics. And in fact, uh, example of uh, space-like submanifolds are uh, interesting because they pro provide some uh, Riemannian submanifold with the properties of uh, of the space time, the space time. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, be uh, physical and settle the problem in uh, three dimension, three plus one dimension. So, what is the Lorentz Minkowski space? You take uh, L three plus one, which is uh, x one, x two, x three, and t and you uh, put the flat metric plus, 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 minus, OK? Now, you take a bounded convex domain. I mean convex, but uh, sometimes it's not necessary that the domain uh, for the domain to be convex. But some, in some case, we will need that assumption. And take uh, a, a set M, which is a, a graph of a function U, which is uh, continuous and Lipschitz on omega. And then we say that this uh, graph is uh, weakly space-like if the gradient is uh, less or equal than one almost everywhere. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, normalize this, this speed. So uh, this, the, 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 the physical uh, um, 
interest is uh, is to compare with the speed of light. So uh, one would be uh, the speed of light C. So here we say weekly space light if the gradient is almost everywhere uh, less than one in, in norm, of course. Then space like if you have a strict inequality in your um, Lipschitz, in the inequality that shows the, that the function is Lipschitz. And we say that it is strictly space like if you know that the function is C1 and the norm of the gradient is strictly less than one. Okay. And then for physical reason, if you have some lines uh of of slope one we call that a light ray okay if in some uh if in some graph m uh you have a slope a line of slope one this is called a light ray okay then there are two important objects uh like in euclidean uh, geometry the first one is what we call the area integral and in this with this metric the area integral is just the integral of the square root of one minus gradient of u square. And then associated to the area integral, of course, there is the first variation, which is called the mean curvature. And the mean curvature of the hypersurface M, uh, which is the graph of the function associated to the function u, is just the divergence of the grad u divided by uh, the square root of one minus grad u square. And formally, of course, this mean curvature uh, is exactly the, um, the derivative of the area integral. OK. Uh, sorry, I went too fast. OK. Now, it means that if you look for an hypersurface as a graph, because you can also look as an hypersurface uh, with parameters, but I'm just focusing on graphs. If you look at a hypersurface um, as a graph, which has a prescribed given curvature, it gives you uh, a PD that you want to solve. Imagine that you want that at x, at each point x uh, of um, your domain omega, you want that the graph associated to you has mean curvature h of x, u of x, then you have to solve this PD, which is a quasi-linear PD, OK? And of course, uh, since I show you that the mean curvature operator arises as the derivative of the area integral, you expect that uh, finding solution to this equation could be done by looking at critical points of the area integral. And that's it. If you define now uh, this energy E of U, which is the area integral plus the primitive of H, uh, and you look at critical point of this, and I wrote it as a geometer here because in this case you want you want uh, you don't you don't want to minimize you want to maximize, um, and you want to prove that there are critical points of this in which set. So that's something uh, David also uh, used yesterday in his, uh, in his uh, talk. The right setting, of course, you have to impose a bound on the gradient. Otherwise, your integral is not defined. So you impose a bound on the gradient. And what, what does it mean to impose a bound on the gradient? This exactly amounts you to impose that your function is Lipschitz. OK, so you have that your set is the set of function, which is Lipschitz continuous with a Lipschitz constant less or equal than one. OK, because you want this to be defined and then attached to this, you usually put some boundary conditions. So you say U of X is equal to some prescribed phi of X on the boundary. OK, now uh, uh, old result by Barnick and Simon told you that as soon as this set C is non-empty, then uh, there is a critical point of this energy functional. And the critical point will be a maximum point, a maximizer. OK, so in fact, and um, the problem, the variation problem can be solved as soon as what does it mean that this set is non-empty? It means that the, bond, the, the boundary data you prescribe needs to be extendable 
as a Lipschitz function in the world domain with a Lipschitz constant less than one. Okay. If, for instance, when you link two points on the boundary by a line and uh, the slope is bigger than one, then there is no such an extension. Okay. Okay. So uh, some important results associated uh, to this in the paper of Bartnik and Simon. I, I'm going to, to, to review a little bit the, the, the literature. Um, these are the, let's say, the, the, the fundamental results uh, in, 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 uh, in those papers, which have been used uh, later by, by different authors. The first uh, fundamental result and uh, fundamental observation done by Bartnik and Simon is uh, what is called the, the light ray lemma. And this light ray lemma tells you the following thing. It says that if in a graph, so, and what I'm telling you here for the moment is that I'm assuming some hypothesis on this H X of T. Let's assume for the moment it's uh, uh, smooth, let's say bounded, it's enough, but L infinity for sure, okay? It says that if the graph contains a small piece of light ray, what does it mean? It means that the solution is following a line, is, uh, is affine along a direction. So u at point xt is u at point x0 plus t times the difference, the distance from x0 to x1. Uh, then, if there is a small piece of light ray, then this light ray extends up to the boundary, okay? So if the graph contains a piece of light ray, then uh, the light ray goes until the boundary, okay? And so somehow to avoid light rays, what do you need? You need that uh, two different points on the boundary uh, should be... Uh, should not be on a on a a fine uh, on, on a line of slope one or bigger than one. Okay. Then a second uh, a second fundamental uh, result in in this paper of Bartnik and Simon is the following. They show that if you have a bound on the gradient on the boundary. Okay. So this this. Uh, writing this here as supremum of one divided by the square root of one minus the gradient u square, asking this to be finite is just saying that the gradient is, uh, is not close to one, okay? If you have uh, a control on the gradient on the boundary, assume for, for the moment that your function is C2 and C1 up to the boundary, so these, are, these objects are all classical uh, derivatives. Then, in fact, from this bound on the boundary, you can uh, derive a bound inside the domain, okay? So this means somehow that if you can control the gradient along the boundary for smooth function, smooth solution, then you have a control everywhere inside the domain. Okay, and this you expect that this kind of control should be uh, attainable if you have information on the boundary data. Okay, and then to have this, to derive this boundary uh, gradient estimate, then usually what you do is you use some radial barrier function, which are in fact function of mean constant mean curvature. Okay. Now, using these two tools, uh, these two fundamental tools, the, the seminal result of Barnick and Simon is that if omega is a C2 alpha domain, and if the boundary data has an extension, which is C2 alpha with a control on the gradient inside the domain, if your function H is C0 alpha and bounded, then uh, the variational problem has a C2 alpha solution and you have a control everywhere of the gradient, okay? That's the, the fundamental uh, result. So what you have to, to, to uh, 
have in mind is somehow that uh, the risk, the, this is kind of a C2 alpha regularity result. If you have a good boundary data, uh, you have a, a good solution. Okay. Of course, this 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 condition of the gradient is kind of special from the from the the kind of problem we have. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm going to discuss today is, in fact, uh, what happens if instead of having this h of x t, so suppose that this h of x t does uh, not depend on uh, on t here, but just on x. And if it's instead of being bounded, it just LP, my interest is instead of doing a C2 alpha regularity uh, theory, I want to do, to do a W2P regularity. Uh, in my title, I say W2Q. So if the, if the, if the data is LQ and uh, we will assume Q bigger than the dimension, then the question is, uh, if the solution is W2Q, okay? And of course, if Q is bigger than dimension, then it implies that your solution is at least C1 alpha for some alpha. Okay, so let me discuss a little bit uh, some other motivation for the study of this problem. And this is the so-called born infer theory. So uh, if you go back to Maxwell equation, you know that there are four equations which are satisfied by uh, an electromagnetic field. So you have the electrical field and you have the magnetic field B. So E is the electrical field, B is the magnetic field. And in these four equation, rho is the uh, charge density and J is the current density of an external uh, source. Now, you know that those Maxwell equation, they comes from a, a variational principle and in fact, if you choose a gauge potential, so you write B as the curl of a magnetic potential, and you, you write E, if it's uh, static, there is no contribution from the magnetic field, and then it's just the gradient of some uh, function, then you end up only with two equations. And these two equations, in fact, they arise as the Euler-Lagrange equation of an action, and this action is called the Lagrangian, the Maxwell-Lagrangian, which is sorry, this Lagrangian Maxwell, this uh, Maxwell-Lagrangian is just one half of the difference of the square of the norm of the electrical field plus the uh, current density applied on the magnetic field minus, and this four pi is just uh, a normalization times uh, the, the charge density times the potential uh, phi, okay? Now, of course, uh, this is uh, one of the equation you studied from the very beginning of your PDE life. Uh, if you uh, just assume that there, there is no magnetic, magnetic field and that everything is time independent, then you know that your electrostatic field is minor, is the gradient of someone and you end up with what is called the Poisson equation. So the Poisson equation is just minus Laplace of phi equal to four pi times uh, the charge density. Remember that uh, I'm in dimension three, okay? Now there is a, a, an issue in physics, which is the following is that uh, what is the uh, electrostatic field produced by a point charge? So assume that you have only a point charge. So uh, it means that mathematically your uh, density is a direct mass. Then you have to solve the equation minus Laplace of phi equal to zero everywhere except at the point where the charge is located. Okay. And this equation has a unique solution if you assume uh, that uh, phi is going to zero at, at infinity. And this unique solution is just this one over uh, the norm of x, okay? Now, if you compute the energy associated to this solution, the energy is just integral of grad phi square. 
So it's e squared here. So it's one over eight pi times the integral of one over x squared, and this is plus infinity. So it means that uh, this is something annoying for uh, people in physics because they don't like that uh, the energy of a point charge is infinite because they call it the energy divergence uh, issue, uh, which is not able to capture what, uh, what is uh, the contribution of a point charge. Oh, for this is not very readable, but if you like these topics, uh, you, you will find a lot of, of things in uh, physics books. And for instance, uh, I, one, one place where you can find some discussion is the classics Feynman lecture on physics. Okay, now uh, we could ask, okay, now uh, what is, assume that now you start from the Poisson equation here and you have a row, a charge density row. What is the mathematical assumption on this row so that the uh, energy of the field is finite? Well, that's something you can ask. And the answer is quite elementary and is provided by the so-called galliardo nirenberg sobolev inequality that I, I recall here. So assume just for instance that indeed you can uh, multiply this by phi, integrate by parts, then you end up with the energy of your field. And to be able to control this energy, you have to control this, okay? Of course, you have to control this not by uh, anything, you have to you need a, a, a control which is again absorbable by uh, the gradient. So what you will do, you will put this phi here in the uh, critical Sobolev space so that after that you can use Sobolev inequality and you just ask this row to be in the conjugate uh, Sobolev spaces. So if you are in dimension three, what you do is just you uh, do an older with an L6 bound on U and a L6 over five on rho. Of course, if you are in another dimension, it's not six over five coming in, but it's a, it will be the conjugate of the, um, of the critical exponent, okay? Now, this means that uh, if you want to control the energy, somehow you need some integrability and the integrability you need is kind of uh, funny, it's six over five. So is there any physical reason for this six over five? Of course not. And uh, you would like to be able to deal with point charge. So uh, Dirac mass is measures. And for sure, you probably want to be able to treat L1 masses. And uh, by the way, this is, uh, you can prove, you can show that there are some uh, examples, and this is one of the examples, I, I don't remember where I took that. I don't know if Luigi Orsina is following the, the lecture, probably. I think I took that from a paper from him and uh, Dino Fortunato and, uh, and Pisani, I think, if I, if I remember well. So this is an L1, char an L1 charge for which uh, the energy of the solution will be infinite. Okay. And so now you can uh, discuss a little bit uh, uh, what uh, David Arcoya was telling yesterday about special relativity and this Lagrangian of special relativity and say why we could not do something similar in electromagnetism. And this, when you, when you go from Newton to uh, special relativity, somehow what you do is you prescribe a new Lagrangian and in this new Lagrangian, of course, this is not uh, something totally, uh, I mean, there is some reason why you choose this, Lag this new Lagrangian. For instance, when V is, um, is close to zero, you recover the Newton uh, Lagrangian, okay? And well, but at least when you decide to say, okay, this is my new Lagrangian, well, this is not, uh, you don't need an experiment to tell you that the, the light V, the, 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 sorry, the, 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 the speed of light is a maximal speed. This is written here because you cannot have V bigger than C in your model, okay? And uh, that's something you can do in, uh, with an electromagnetic theory and that was proposed by Born and Infeld. So they proposed this new Lagrangian and this is called Born-Infeld Lagrangian. 
And this is exactly the same shape as the uh, special relativity uh, Lagrangian energy. And of course, for small densities, for small uh, values of the fields, you should recover the uh, Maxwell theory, right? You can again choose a potential and, and a gauge potential, uh, uh, um, and, and you have still a variational structure. And in fact, if you do that, you define two new fields. Of course, these new fields, they are kind of uh, singular when your, uh, when your intensity here is, uh, is close to B, uh, B square, B square over two here, sorry. And, um, but still the, the structure is kind of the same. You end up with two equations and these two equations, they are Euler-Lagrange equation of uh, a Lagrangian. Okay. And if you know, if you want to, to learn more, there is a, a two column paper in nature by Bord and Infeld. And then there are some longer uh, papers. These are reference if you want to, to learn about uh, the history of this. Okay. Now uh, you have your new Lagrangian. Well, for some reason uh, and for some physical reason, I, I, I am not going to enter into the details, but there are some variant of, of this, of this uh, uh, theory. Now, going back to uh, the electrostatic regime, so assuming that there is no magnetic field, assuming that everything is time independent, I said, okay, uh, the structure is the same, so I have this equation here, uh, the divergence of this field D, so we can write it. And okay, we can write it. We have divergence of this guy here equal to four pi times the density. But uh, now you see that it means that the intensity of your electrical field has to be at most B. Otherwise, this guy is not defined. And you can ask, okay, assume you can write this equation. Let's compute the energy, what we call Hamiltonian energy. So. Remember that in, in mechanics, when you compute an energy, you have to use the Legendre transform of the action. Okay, so this is the energy associated to this equation. And one question is: Okay, assume now you have a, a Dirac mass here. Is it true that the solution uh, is of finite energy? And the answer is: If everything is computable, if you have the right to compute everything, then the answer is yes. And you can, uh, of course, um, justify this computation. So you have the electrical field, which is of the type x over uh, modules of x and a correction. Okay, This correction depends on the dimension. Here, this value uh, 4 here is uh, because I'm, dimension, I'm in dimension 3. OK, and then you see that, indeed, uh, the only value of x at which the gradient is 1 is 0. It's not 0 everywhere else. And the energy is finite. OK. Now, you can ask also, what about if I have a L1 density now? Because L1 was not good also for uh, the uh, Maxwell case. So let's see now for this uh, born infeld case. And the answer is, again, Assume you can give a meaning to this equation. So you multiply by phi and you integrate. Then you see that uh, the conclusion will be a consequence of another very important inequality in, uh, in PDEs, which is the Moray-Sobolev inequality. In fact, thanks to the Moray-Sobolev combined to uh, the Sobolev inequality, you can bound this guy from below by uh, L infinity norm of phi, and since your row is an L1, you can order this guy, got a, a norm here of phi L infinity and uh, L1 norm of the density, and this gives you a control on the L infinity norm of phi. But since you have a N L infinity norm uh, control on the L infinity norm of phi, you mean it means that this is controlled because it's controlled by this product. And so you end up with uh, a solution which has finite energy. But uh, don't forget that when I say that this has a solution, I didn't say anything about what kind of solution, because this operator obviously is singular. 
Okay. Uh, so, uh, a question also that you can ask is, what about if you don't put any charge? Well, what you would like to do is, of course, to multiply by phi, integrate by part, and then end up with the contradiction that uh, the gradient has to be zero everywhere. But you have to, in, 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 uh, to, to justify the integration by part. OK, so there is, in fact, a deep theorem uh, behind this, is, uh, which is called, uh, well, usually when you ask for solution in the wall space with a zero on the right hand side, and you want to prove that your solution is affine, uh, this is what is called a Bernstein problem. And the Bernstein problem in Minkowski space was solved by Calabi until uh, uh, up to dimension four in the, in 68 and by Sheng and Yo in 76 uh, in other dimension. And in fact, so even without integrability assumption, the only solution of this equation are solution of our affine uh, hyperplanes. Okay. Um, observe that there is no restriction on the dimension. There is a deep, deep, deep theory in the Euclidean space. You know that from dimension eight and above, there is there are some Simon's cone and there are some other solution than the uh, tri trivial solution. So in the Euclidean space, there is a restriction. This is the famous paper by, I don't remember, Giusti, Bombieri and I, I, I'm sorry for those who I forgot. Okay, um, just an, another observation. There are some solution of this equation which are, I mean, not solution of the equation, but which are maximizing hypersurfaces. And the only one is the non-strictly space-like hyperplane of, of, of slope one. This was, this was proved by, by Bachnik. Now, if you prefer vector fields to uh, gradient, there is a there is a, a, a Bernstein problem for vector fields. You can also say what happened in the magnetostatic uh, regime. But uh, this maybe I, I skip this. Now, um, just to 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 go back to this uh, equation, electrostatic bond infrared equation. Now, this is exactly of the same shape, uh, shape as the functional I show you at the beginning uh, and, and treated by uh, Bartnik and Simon. Well, now I'm, I, I've written it in a setting which is more familiar to uh, analysts than geometers because this guy now I will try to minimize it and not uh, maximize it. Okay. And in fact, the Bartnik and Simon result does not apply to uh, unbounded uh, set and does not apply to unbounded data. So what I want to discuss with you today is what about when my row here is an integrable data, what can I say about solution of this? Now, there is also uh, something very interesting, but uh, probably I, I'm not going to enter the details uh well there is a, a very very nice uh preprint that appeared some weeks ago by uh, uh, four, four or five authors and there are at least uh, andrea malchiodi luciano mari uh, and some uh, japanese bayong i think and and i i forgot the last name but uh it is also interesting uh to to study the problem where uh, instead of a, of a, of a integrable data you put a superposition of of uh, dirac masses but i'm not going to discuss it. almost everything is open in that case uh even if there are some papers in the literature they are not correct in fact okay uh i wanted to say something about the calculus of variation and what about the validity of the Euler equation uh, when you do very few assumptions. This is, uh, this is a, a topic that uh, has been uh, very much studied by uh, Italian people. Let me just summarize it. Um, so you, you want to minimize uh, uh, a Lagrangian that depends on the gradient with some, uh, uh, on some domain. Okay. And in fact, to, to, to get the, to get the, um, the Euler-Lagrange equation is not that easy. You need some assumption. 
And uh, usually what is uh, missing is that uh, when you do your variation, you don't always have enough control. Okay, let me, let me just mention that uh, as far as I know, there are some very uh, nice results by De Giovanni and Marzocchi, uh, which has also have been also extended by Cellina and Marcellini, that give you some kind of uh, optimal uh, uh, condition to, to, to be able to de de derive the earlier Lagrange equation from the, from the, uh, from the functional. Now, if you look at uh, what we have, we have something which is super convex. I mean, super convex is nothing. There is no definition for super convex, but uh, you see what I mean. Uh, it means that this guy, if I if I uh, write the Taylor expansion of this, I have any coefficient which is positive, and I have a, a singularity here. Okay, so you see that this cannot be extended as a convex function. Okay, impossible to extend it as a convex function. Convex function, except if I truncate. But if I truncate, then I have to study a truncated problem. And I have to prove that they have a priori estimate, and this is not an easy task. Okay, so remember that when you have this functional, and you want to derive some. Uh, uh, the earlier Lagrange equation, well, there are some troubles because you have to, to impose that condition on the gradient, okay? And this is not enough to control this quantity, by the way. And another problem is that if you take a variation, let's, let's call it eta, if I take u plus t eta, of course, um, my gradient has to stay less, uh, smaller than one, always. And this implies that you can take only variation which 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 has uh, which satisfy this condition that gradient u scalar gradient eta is negative. Okay, this means that you don't have a dense set of uh, variation, so you don't recover the uh, the, the PDE. Okay, uh, for those who, who who likes free boundaries, I, I, I yesterday I. I listened uh, to a talk in, in Portuguese. Uh, I, I, it was not announced, but I, I was happy to listen to it. And uh, so if you like to, if you like these uh, free boundaries, you can also say, let's say uh, we put a convex constraint and re you try to replace it by some obstacle. And then uh, you try to obtain the earlier equation from some condition outside the free boundaries. And this is the strategy of Caffarelli Friedman in some uh, in some uh, deep studies. But I, I, I have no idea if this can be done in this setting. OK, now let me uh, in the in the last minutes I have, let me discuss the result we got. So first thing is that when you want to uh, study this equation, you have to decide for a functional framework. And uh, as David said yesterday, when you look at this uh, kind of problem, you need to work in um, space of Lipschitz function. So since we are working in, uh, in a REN, in the world space, uh, we need to, to uh, take, let's say, at least function with a, with a homogeneous sub -OLF, uh, spaces. So by this, I mean that the, uh, the gradient of U is in L2. I ask moreover that the gradient is in L infinity and that it has uh, an L infinity norm less than one. I'm assuming that rho is just uh, such that it defines a continuous linear functional on X, only this. For instance, it can be a measure, no problem at all. Okay, so what we, we, we showed with uh, Pietro D'Avenia and uh, Alessio Pomponio is that we can relax the notion of, uh, the notion of solution, in fact, we just uh, relax it to the notion of uh, convex uh, analysis. And we say that we have a solution in the weak sense if we do satisfy the variational inequality, which is this one, okay? By the way, this inequality, uh, if um, uh, th this guy here, uh, I, mean, I mean, this inequality implies that this guy here is in L1, which means that the measure of the set where the gradient is one is uh, zero, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that this set cannot be nasty. This set can be very nasty, 
So the fact that it has measure zero does not imply at all that you can recover the, the, the weak, the, the, the PDE in a weak form. Okay. Now, what, what we proved, we, we proved that if the, the data is, uh, is uh, smooth in a sense that it is bounded, then indeed uh, you can prove that phi is, in, is, is a C1 weak solution of the PDE and you have a control on the gradient. Uh, by the way, this control on the gradient, I'm not sure if I'm correct here, probably is, uh, is only local. Uh, the gradient could approach one at infinity. Okay, and this you can do that, you can prove that with the theory of Bartnik and Simon, essentially. Now, uh, what we proved also, we proved that if the, the, the density has some radial uh, symmetry, then the solution is C1. Okay. You don't need boundedness in that case. You don't need boundedness. And the gradient can could be one at some point, but only at the origin. Uh, so you see that the 1D setting is much, much easier in a way than the, 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 the higher order, I mean, the multidimensional setting. Now, the next result we got, and that's the, 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 the title of the talk, and this is uh, something for which you have to pay a price. So it's not something you can get from Bartnik and Simon paper. You have to work for it. So we, we showed with uh, uh, Alessandro Jacopetti, and independently, uh, there is a paper by Axeli Ahala, uh, who appeared uh, in archive. I think Axeli was first. He, he, he put his results in archive some months before us. And if rho is in LP and P is bigger than the dimension, then you can in fact prove that your solution is a weak C1 alpha solution. In fact, what we prove, we prove that it's a W2P solution. And so the alpha is even computable, it's one minus N over P. And there is a control which is uh, less than one. So how we do that, we use uh, approximating C1 alpha solution by regularizing the, the, the data row. And then um, this, in fact, approximation allows to recover the PDE in the limit. And how we do that, we, we took inspiration from the Bartnik and Simon paper. So we first prove a gradient estimate. I'm sorry, this is uh, not very uh, elementary to write. So we have a, a quite involved uh, um, gradient estimate. We manage to get to get an estimate of the gradient at infinity, which is kind of like Bartnik and Simon got uh, a gradient estimate close at the boundary. And from the gradient estimate at infinity, we are uh, able to propagate the information inside and to prove that there is no uh, uh, singularity inside the, 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 the space. Now, what uh, we have been uh, able to do next, we have been uh, in contact with Axeli Ahala and uh, Xia Zong. They are both from uh, Finland, from Helsinki. And we proved that, in fact, we can also manage uh, an LP data in half space with a zero on the boundary. And again, we have this kind of regularity result. And we were also able to deal with a convex domain. So if we put zero on a convex domain, on the boundary of a convex domain, then we can prove W2P regularity for this equation. But uh, it is uh, very, I, I wouldn't say strange, but think about what can, uh, what can be, how a function can be nasty if your domain, if the boundary, if the domain is not convex, and think about all this possible singularity of the gradients, uh, it, it is really, um, we, we don't know if, if, if this is uh, true in non-convex domain. We believe so, but uh, we have no, no clue for the moment. And I suggest that I skip the last part of the talk and, and I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dindy. <clears throat> uh, let, let's see if, if he has any remarks or comments. Uh, oh, yeah, a... so, yeah uh, not at all. Not at all. Uh, 
because we don't go we don't we don't go to uh, really what we do is that um, uh, we take the we reg we regularize the data and we work with very smooth uh, solution and uh, with C two alpha solution and then we we have to really to to prove a stable gradient estimate that that resists when you go to the limit. So there is not at all this functional framework of, uh, of the bit now. Thank you. We, we work Thank in C2 alpha framework. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the domain, uh, convex domain is, yeah. is can, can be improved? Uh, uh, we, uh, for the moment, we don't know. For the moment, we don't know. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we, we, we learned recently, I, I mentioned this preprint of uh, Malchiodi and co-authors, Luciano Mari and Andrea Malchiodi, sorry. And they have they are very uh, strange examples. Of course, it's not it's not like uh, it's not like our assumption because we assume that the data is in LP with p bigger than dimension, and that's very very important because if p is less than dimension, we cannot ex we, we cannot expect that our result uh, will hold. But it's even worse. They have uh, an example where the data is uh, I, if I. I hope I'm correct, but it's in some LP with P less than a dimension. I, I think it's L2 or a measure. I don't remember. I, I, at least it's in, it's uh, it's uh, it's fine with the energy framework in the sense that it gives you a continuous um, it, it gives you a continuous uh, uh, mapping uh, in the in the in the energy space. Okay, so it's 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 like it. it one would like to call it it's in the dual of the space, but we don't have a our space is a, is a cone, so it's not really duality. But anyway, uh, so it's it's a it's a data you 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 expect to be able to to treat, and they show that which we they show an example of a data for which the Euler Lagrange equation is not satisfied. So the 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 the, the minimizer of the functional exists. But it doesn't solve the uh, Euler Lagrange equation. Okay. Uh, 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 the dimension is uh, how uh, it's work for whole dimension, or there is uh, some restriction? Well, uh, I, I'm dealing here with dimension three and bigger, uh -huh. because dimension two, dimension two is uh, is tricky. Uh -huh. Because dimension two, you don't have the Sobolev uh, critical Sobolev exponent, mm -hmm. and so you know that um, I'm not saying that we cannot do anything in dimension two, but uh, yeah, uh, the argument does not go straight. Uh, it's it's not direct. You, you have to work a little bit. I could imagine that something can be done, and I, I believe that uh, geometrically it's even easier in dimension two than in dimension three. Mm -hmm. Because then you can relate really. You can and, and if you go in the paper of Luciano Mari and, and Andrea Malchiodi, it's written with a with a geometrical language, and uh, I I think they do many things in dimension two, and uh, yeah, you, you probably you can do, but uh, we 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 deal with dimension three and bigger. Yeah, very interesting, probably. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks to the audience and thanks to the organizers. Thank you very much. Um, I invite all the audience mm. to continue to next talk. Uh, ah, there is a question by Marcos. Ah, okay, Marcos. The usual mean curvature problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm not sure I'm getting the question. So the mean curvature in the Euclidean space is in BV because, because of course, you, you miss some information at infinity um, because uh, at infinity, the problem is kind of linear. The, the functional is, is, is loose convexity somehow. 
and uh, and then yeah, indeed you you know you you go to bounded variation space, but uh, here is totally different. Uh, well, you have some duality between Euclidean uh, mean curvature and uh, Lorentz Minkowski curvature, but no. Um, the, the, here there is no there is no need. In fact, the the, the 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 let me say it in this way. This this problem is nasty because you have a singularity uh, in the gradient, and this is very uh, annoying. But from the functional point of view, the situation is very good because you are working with Lipschitz function. And Lipschitz function, they behave much better than a BV function. So you have, since you deal with a singular problem, you deal with better function. But of course, there is a price to pay. And, uh, and uh, OK, but no, nothing to do with BV space. Thank you. Let's see if he has another question. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the sun in Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to see you personally. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. I invite you all the audience to continue with you to the next talk. We will be going in seven minutes.
Hello, everybody. Let's go to the elastic talk before lunch. Uh, it is an honor for me to introduce Professor Luigi Orsina from University of Roma, Sapienza, Italy. He will talk about uh, elliptic problems related to the trimester problem. Uh, Professor Orsina has uh, many uh, remarkable papers, uh, mainly on regularity, trimester, maximum principle, etc. Uh, I liked very much a uh, paper by Strong Maximum Principle, wrote in collaboration uh, with uh, Luigi Boccardo. Uh, welcome, Professor Luigi. Thank Please, you. Uh, the word is up to you. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the, the invitation. Now I'm going to present my screen. I hope uh, everyone can see it. So uh, I, I would like to begin by thanking all the organizers for inviting me to this talk. It's a pity that I cannot give it in person. Okay. My heart is there with you, <laughs> even if my body is here in Rome, where the weather is not very good today, so uh, not even nice as, uh, as usual, but it's February, so it's a little bit cold. So uh, as uh, the title says, this uh, is uh, there is a uh, the talk is about uh, some elliptic problems, some elliptic systems related to the so-called thermistor problem. So let me begin with uh, uh, a little, let's say, physics introduction, just to explain uh, what is a, a thermistor. I, I, I promise I will be brief with the physics because uh, it's not my field, of course. I'm more a mathematical, mathematic. <laughs> As a, of course. So uh, a thermistor is a device uh, in which the electrical resistance is dependent on the temperature of the body. So uh, this gives rise to a mathematical model. So if omega is a bounded open subset of R n and n is larger than two, so this is the body of the device, then if uh, psi, uh, as Lucio said yesterday, Greek letters for uh, some uh, unknowns and uh, Roman letters for the other one. If psi is the electrical resistance and u is the temperature, then you put together ohm low, Fourier loads, and you combine them. You let time in the in the in the problem, and so you get this uh, system, parabolic elliptic system. So you have uh, a parabolic equation for the temperature and uh, an elliptic equation for the electri electrical resistance. And the two terms that uh, link the two equations together are a term A of U, a term B of U, which are respectively the thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity. And the link is done using this, uh, the right-hand side of the first equation of the system, that is to say B of U gradient C squared. So this is the link between the two equations. So uh, this is the uh, full. Then you uh, add uh, some boundary conditions. Uh, the, the problem is elliptic parabolic, and you look for solution. I will may be mainly interested in a in a version in, in a kind of related problem to the stationary version of this problem. So we will forget from now on the dependence on time. So U T for us will be zero. And so this gives rise to the stationary problem with is this one. So you now it's an elliptic elliptic system. Of course, it's elliptic if you suppose that A of U and B of U are strictly larger than a positive constant uh, for every value of U. And uh, there are a lot of results on this, uh, on this uh, system. Uh, mainly concerned about existence and the toughest problem, which is uniqueness of solutions. 
And uh, the idea is to add some suitable growth conditions on A of U, on B of U, that is to say on the two connectivities, and then to add boundary data. Boundary data, for example, one can give uh, uh, both the temperature and uh, the electrical potential on, the, on a part of the boundary of omega. So you, you have your device, you put heat on a, one side and electricity on the other one, and so you measure everything inside the, the body. So there are a lot of papers. I will quote here only some of them by, by Cimatti, for example, in 1989-1990. And I refer to all the references that are in there for all the possible cases in which this, uh, this problem is, uh, is studied. So uh, the, the main idea of the proof actually is a sort of change of variable for the, the problem, uh, which uh, allows to prove very, not very easily, but to, to work in a better way on the, on, on the problem, forgetting somehow the bad term. The bad term here, here is the coupling term, the term in which B of U gradient C squared appears. So the idea is the following. Just to fix the idea right, right now, let's say that A of U and B of U are equal to one. So there is no dependence on the temperature of the conductivities. Uh, so everything is homogeneous. And so you have this simple equation. A plus and u is uh, equal to gradient C squared, then gradient C is zero. This is just to fix the idea. Clearly here, uh, you solve the second one, and you work with the first, and so everything works. So just to fix the idea, you define w as u plus C squared over 2. And you calculate the gradient. So the gradient of W is gradient of U plus uh, psi, the gradient of psi. And when you, you take the divergence to calculate the Laplacian minus the Laplacian of W, you have three terms, uh, two coming, one coming from the Laplacian of U and the other coming from the divergence of psi, gradient of psi. And so you end up with these uh, two facts, minus Laplacian U minus grad six squared on one side and psi times the Laplacian minus the Laplacian of psi on the other side. Since they are the first one from the equation, the first uh, the equation is zero and the second one is zero, the, the total is zero, so W is an harmonic function. This helps you very much, of course, because then you combine the boundary data, U on some part of the boundary, C squared on some other part of the boundary, you get a nice problem which you assign boundary data on W, you solve it, and so you recover existence, uniqueness, and so on. Mind you, this is very, you know, very, very, very easy problem in which there is, actually, there is no coupling because the second equation, there is no dependence on U. In the general case, uh, you arrive at an equation which is minus divergence of B of U gradient of W equals to zero, and B is the coefficient which appears in the equation for psi, and, but uh, the change of variable is, uh, is no longer U plus C squared over two, but is H of U plus C squared over U. And here, H of U is nothing but a primitive zero in zero, to maintain uh, boundary values somehow, of the quotient A of S divided B of S. And this is the, 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 the main point somehow. You make this change of variable and you recover a simple elite, simple in some, some sense, because now B of U may be degenerate, may, be, may explode, depends on, uh, on the form that it has on U. Then you can recover information on W and from W, both on H of U and on Psi squared, and so uh, under some positiveness, assumption, and so on, you can recover information on U and Psi. So this is for the thermistor problem studied uh, as far as existence, uniqueness is concerned, and as far as the papers by Cimatti and uh, all the, the references quoted in those papers are concerned with. So now the, this thermistor part is over, and now I will uh, try to explain which are the difference between the, the, the physical problems of the thermistor and the problem I'm going to talk to you about. 
because the physical part is over. And now we will study, we, I will show you the analytic system, which let's say has little or no physical meaning in the general, in the general form. So this is the system, which strongly remembers and resembles the uh, thermistor problems we have seen uh, before under some assumptions on the functions A and B, which appears here. And so since it is almost like that one, I will underline the differences from the, the one we, you, I showed you before. So uh, here we have homogeneous boundary conditions on U and Psi. And G is a, fun is a non-negative function bounded on omega. So we have th the main difference are, first of all, we have changed the boundary conditions. We have no longer U and C assigned on some part of the boundary of omega, but U is zero and Psi is zero on the, the uh, boundary of the set, the open boundary subset of Rn where the problem posed. Then we have added two lower order terms, so plus U, on the, in the first equation, a plus sign the second one, which of course has less and less physical meaning somehow. Uh, then we have added the source term, G of X, that is to say we have exchanged the boundary data with a source term. So we are, we are adding uh, electrical charges somehow on omega, the, the second equation is the electrical one. And we have added a dependence with respect to x for the, let's say under quotes, conductivities a of x, u and b of x of u, which appear in the uh, equation. So these are the, the, the main differences. So somehow we are taking into account, for example, non-homogeneous media, because uh, a and b may depend on the, the variable x on the place on omega where you are putting everything. Uh, here, A of B are no longer functions, but are matrix value function. And I will uh, tell you in the next slide the assumption of that. First of all, first of, before giving this assumption, let me say that all the results have been obtained in collaboration with uh, Mr. Boccardo. And of course, there is a qu gradient quadratic term in the equation, so we cannot let it slide. We have seen it, and so we started to work on it because you know, it's a sort of trademark of the, of the collaboration of Lucio for first and my, my collaboration with Lucio for second, the part of the gradient uh, quadratic term. So it's very nice to work uh, on this, uh, uh, this subject. And so they have been published on a paper in Science Journal of Mathematical Analysis last year. And uh, so this is the system. I quote it uh, again. And let me add the final assumption. As I said, A and B are matrix value. They are karate odori, measurable in X and uh, continuous in U, which are controlled from above and from below by, uh, okay, this is, uh, there, is, there is a mistake uh, in the first formula. There is not, uh, it's not sigma of T in green, of course, it's A of X and uh, U, uh, A of X and T as if there is B in the, the second one are controlled from above and from below by some uh, uh, functions rho of t and sigma of t. The, the, the first one is controlled by rho from above and from below, so they have the same growth. And the second one is controlled by a function sigma from above and from below. And uh, I, I will need another slide, I'm sorry, uh, to, to show the assumption, and, but these are uh, of course, alpha and beta are positive constants and finite constants. And we will suppose uh, this assumption on the function rho and the function sigma. The first, they are both powers of T, so they are po both powers of U, the temperature of the, of the body. And uh, the, the, so the, the, the first one, A of X uh, and T is controlled uh, from above and from below by a p power of t of u, and the second one is controlled by a q power of u. So for example, the model case in which uh, we take a of x and t to be rho of t times the identity matrix and the same for b is this one. So we have, you have a coupling, 
you have uh, one plus uh, absolutely u u to the power p grad u plus u equals something in which the q power of u appears, and the same q powers appear in, appears in the second uh, equation. Mind you, I've written these two functions rho and sigma in this way, but for the moment, uh, there is no assumption, actually, there will never be an assumption on the sign of P and Q. That is to say, you may have something positive, P and or Q, or something negative. For example, if P is negative or Q is negative, both elliptical operators degenerate if U becomes plus infinity, because you have something like a gradius square divided plus one plus U to a certain positive power. So for the moment, I assure this is the, the real uh, assumption, there will be no assumptions on the side. You can take P one million and Q minus one million with some restrictions I will show you. And there is no relations for the moment between P and Q. So it can be P larger than Q, P equal Q or P smaller than Q. There is absolutely no uh, difference between the, the, the assumptions. So it may be, for the moment, it, it may be uh, everything. So this is the problem, which if P or Q are positive is bad because you have a large growth with respect to the unknown. Remember, there is a dependence on X somewhere that I hid in here because I've taken everything homogeneous. And then you may have a bad growth on the right hand side of the first equation because you have not only the grad c squared but also the power of u to the q which may be huge and or it may be q positive and p negative so they generate on one side very big on the other one so the problem is really really messy so uh just to to fix the ideas let me recall that for the thermistor problem the main role of the change of variable was this function, AHT, AHT which is the uh, primitive of A over B, of the two conductivities. In this, this change of variables is not possible because A of X and B of X depend on U. So you cannot, you can integrate, of course, but then you cannot derive. You cannot take, uh, once you make the comp composition H of U, the gradient is no longer the the quotient of the functions and but the, the counterpart uh, since a of x and b of x grow from above and from below as rho and sigma respectively the main the major role will be this new function h which is actually the quotient of rho over sigma the the, the control pro for a divided the control for b which under the assumptions I made takes this form. And here we begin to see that there should be a relation between P and Q, because of course, if the exponent of P uh, in, the, in the, the right hand side is positive, that is to say if P is larger than Q minus one, this is an unbounded function which uh, explodes at infinity. If it's zero, the function, okay, there will be a logarithmic growth, for example, and if it is negative, it is a bounded function. So, for example, if you look above, you have h of u, it's going to be a bounded function. You cannot recover any information as h of u uh, on u from something you know on h of u. But anyway, this will be the, 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 the main function we will use, and all everything will depend on the behavior of ht at infinity. That is to say that it doesn't matter if p is positive or negative, or if q is positive or negative, it is important if p is larger than q minus 1, equal to q minus 1, or smaller than q minus 1. Because in the three cases, okay, the yellow one, p equals q minus 1, you have a logarithmic growth. On the other two uh, kinds, you have uh, a, po a polynomial which explodes or which is uh, or something, a function which is bounded at infinity. Okay, so the first case I will deal is the, let's say the positive case. It's the main theorem of the paper with uh, Lucio Boccardo. And it is in the, 
in the, of course, green assumption. Uh, that is to say, when p is larger than q minus 1. So in this case, uh, well, recall that g is a positive function in L infinity, then we prove that there exist weak solutions, that is to say solutions in w1 to 0. Uh, u is positive, c uh, psi is positive, and is bounded of the system that I quoted uh, you before. And then we have uh, a lot of properties uh, uh, which, let's say, improve the, the, the knowledge of the functions u and psi. That is to say, there is a, a, a positive number gamma depending on g, actually depending on the norm of g in L infinity, such that e to the gamma h of u is in L1. So you recall that h of u under this assumption is a polynomial, so you have that a certain, the exponential of a certain power of u is in L1. So this is a huge estimate on, on u. And then, no matter the growth of uh, a and b, no matter the values of p of q, uh, if they satisfy the assumption p larger than q minus 1, you have that the vector fields which, appears inside, which appear inside the divergence are in L2 to 2 to the n. So you can take good test functions, w1 to 0 in the equations, and the term b x of u grad c grad c, that is the right hand side, is actually in L1. So you can, it is enough for the first equation to, to take test function in uh, w1 to 0 and L infinity in order to give the meaning. You do not need to have c1 0 uh, Completely supported C1 functions in order to, to give a meaning to the definition of solution. So, this is the, the main results. Now, the remarks on the results. So, this is the problem you see in the right hand corner. Uh, the first one is you look the first equation, we have a term that I am I, finishing to say is in L1, but the solution is H10. So in W1 to 0, so the datum is in L1, but the solution is better than what one will expect, even in the case in which a, x of u is uh, 1, if the entity matrix you have the Laplacian, if you solve something, the Laplacian of u with an L1 data, you get something which is not of finite energy, not in W1 to 0. So despite the fact that the datum is only in L1, you have a regularizing effect, and this is a typical fact. Lucio has uh, quoted you yesterday a lot, a lot of problems in which this happens. You find better solution despite bad data because there is a coupling between the system because there are, in the case of Lucio's talk, there is cancellation. So this is the, a nice effect of the presence of the two equations uh, that are allows to have uh, finite energy solutions for the first equation despite the datum is only one. The second one is that the same result, you do not need power-like functions. You need to have that there is some gamma such that e to the gamma h of t is larger, meaning that it diverges faster than both rho and sigma at infinity. So you have a control on uh, the term e to the gamma h of t allows you to control both rho and sigma. That is to say, both the growth of a and b, the bad, the possibly bad, bad uh, terms you have in, in the equation. So there is no need of, of, of course, uh, you have, we have polynomial growth for rho and sigma, while uh, if p is larger than q minus 1, we have an exponential growth. So this is larger than both of them, e to the gamma h of t, for no matter the values of the gamma. I, I, as you will see, we will use this fact. Uh, simple case, a are bounded functions. In this case, p is equal to q is equal to 0. The theorem holds, because p, is, of course, is larger than minus 1. If a and b are equals, equal then rho is equal to sigma, more or less, so you have that p equals to q which is larger than q minus 1, so everything is, is OK. So 
you, you are allowed to have the same terms in both equations. And just a little remark to, on why p is larger than q minus 1. I, I will refer on the upper right corner of, the, of this problem. So uh, uh, recall the model. You have p and you have q. p in the first and q in the second. Here you have no dependence on uh, uh, x. So the term is inside the divergence of the first equation is something like the gradient of uh, u to the p plus 1, morally. So you have the gradient of u plus uh, u to the p plus 1 on one side and the gradient of u to the q. If you call uh, w 1 plus uh, u to the p plus 1, then you get minus divergence of the gradient of w equals plus u equals, and the term uh, 1 plus u to the q becomes w to the q divided by, by p plus 1. And q divided by p plus 1 is smaller than 1. So somehow you have a something which is sublinear. Now forget the term grad c squared. Or suppose that grad c is very regular, so that the term is not only in, in L1, but for example, is bounded because you have uh, q you have, you have something that guarantees that the gradient of C, for example, is bounded under assumptions uh, in which G is very, very regular. So you have a sublinear equation, and sublinear equations are very uh, easier to study than superlinear equations, of course. That, then if you have minus Laplacian and V equals W equals uh, W squared times a weight, it's uh, almost a nightmare. You may have no existence. If the exponent is too large. In this case, these assumptions allow somehow to work because you have somehow a sublinear term in the, the, the best term in the coupling term. Uh, finally, let me say that in the, the case uh, p equals to q, uh, and with the, the aim of studying the existence and summability of u independence of the a possible change of summability of g not only bounded by the ensemble backspaces. There is a, uh, a paper of almost 15 years ago with, uh, by Lucio uh, Boccardo, myself, and Alessio Borretta, where we studied all the possible, possible uh, uh, dependence of the summability of both u and uh, uh, psi on the, the summability of g. But in this case, we are going to take into account only the fact that in which g is a bounded function. So now, some uh, let give me uh, five minutes to give some ideas of uh, of uh, the proof of the of the result. The first step is more or less is truncate everything. That is to say, you have both terms a of x of u, b of x of u, the gradient c squared everywhere. You truncate everything. Mind you, the proof is very long. Eh? So, and the idea is, you take the truncation at level plus or minus n, n, and you put it everywhere you want to truncate. So you put it inside a of x, you put it inside b of x, and since you want bounded data for the first equation, you put you divide everything by one plus one over n gradient c n squared. So you take this problem, and it is, uh, you use uh, Schauder's theorem, fixed point theory, and you find that for every n, there is a solution, un cn, of this problem. So you use this more or less standard. Everything now is bounded, because uh, no matter if p is positive, positive or negative, the truncation on uh, un excludes cancels every, every trouble you may have. So, and then once you have UN, once you have uh, Psi N, you prove a priori estimate. Some of them are easy, some of them are difficult, some of them are very difficult, very long and very complicated. So the idea is, the first one is trivial and is somehow the motivation for putting the term Psi of N in the second equation, the lower order test. 
you prove that the norm of psi n in L infinity is bounded by the norm of G in L infinity. For this, you use the lower order term in the first equation. Mind you, if Q is negative, if B degenerates, it is difficult to obtain an a priori estimate in L infinity using something which is not elliptical using the operator. So you need to use psi n, you need to use the lower order term if you want to treat the problem in the full generality of having Q minus 1 million, for example. So the first one, you use the lower order term and you prove an estimate on psi n in L infinity, which is key of everything. The second one, you and this is, you use only the second equation, you drop the, the, the operator, and so you, you prove the estimate. The second one, which is very difficult, you need to use the two equations, you need to use the assumption, is a proof on e to the gamma h of tn un, that is to say, you prove that if there exists a gamma such that uh, e of uh, the exponential of gamma h calculated in tn of un is bounded in L1, independent on n, and then on the truncation of un in w1 to 0. You cannot have an estimate on un alone. You have to work on tn of un, but then you manage to, to find uh, whatever you may need on the sequence un, no matter how. And then once you have that, you prove uh, once you, you have the exponential estimates on uh, h e to the gamma h and so on, you prove an estimate of psi n in w1 to 0, and then on the vectors in L2 to the n, which appears here, then you use again that t is larger than q minus 1, and then you have to pass the limit. And here the problem is that the problem is in the right hand side of the first equation because. Due to the fact that the elliptical the constant, the elliptical term, the ellipticity of the second operator, the operator in the second equation, depends on u, which may degenerate if q, for example, is negative. Some results, such such as, uh, uh, for example, almost everywhere convergence of the gradient of psi n, uh, you cannot obtain them. So you have something which is morally bounded only in L1 in the second, uh, in the first equation in the right hand side, but you do not know it's almost everywhere limit because you, you do not have a, a result of uh, almost everywhere convergent, which is uh, classical uh, by papers of Boccard de Murat for uh, the gradients of psi n. So you have this term which is only bounded in L1 and you do not know what uh, to do with it. And so the idea is that you use the second equation, the fact that you can pass to the limit in the second equation, morally with psi as the function in the second equation. And so you prove that uh, actually the right hand side of the first equation converges, the integral times the test function converges to its limit, its uh, hope limit, which is bx of u grad c, grad, grad, uh, grad uh, c squared. So the idea is, once again, it is not easy. You have to use the second equation to pass the limit in the first one. And so this shows you that there is a strong link between the two uh, equations. So the main estimate is on uh, the, the main idea is the, on e to the gamma. Now I will uh, be brief just to give you an idea in a simple case. Suppose that every everything is one, so rho is one, sigma is one, p is zero, q is zero, so h of t is t. And so this is the idea. Now we have dropped the, imagine that you have passed already to the limit, some, everything is uh, allowed. So you have no ends, no truncation, not everything, everything is uh, formal here. So you take e to the gamma u minus one in the first equation, and so you get this term, the inequality is due that you have dropped the, the minus one on the right hand side. And then the idea is to take in the second equation psi times the exponential. And so you have the first term, which comes from uh, the, the derivative of psi, which is exactly what you have in the right hand side of the first equation, so plus a positive term. And then 
I brought on the other side, there is a minus somewhere, but uh, in, the, in the last term, this minus gamma, the gradient. But anyway, this is not important because here on the right hand side, we can work with Young inequality or Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And so you have one half of something plus a gamma squared. I forgot uh, uh, in the last integral uh, in this term here, uh, there is a psi missing, which when you do Young appears here in, uh, as the gradient of C squared. But in L infinity, it is OK because everything is bounded. Is bounded. And so you see the, you have this term on the right which can be absorbed on the left, but you are paying gamma squared. Now, if you watch, you have this term here, e to the gamma u, is controlled by gamma squared, gradius squared, e to the gamma u, which appears with the constant gamma here. So what you do, next page, so you have these two estimates with some constants. You put them together, and so on the terms with e to the gamma u, you have something which depends on g. And you have gamma on one side and gamma squared on the other one. You take gamma small enough, this is positive, and so you have an estimate on this term and not this term. Now you have u e to the gamma u on the left and e to the gamma u on the right, which is OK, because u, if u is larger than 1, this term eats the other one if u is larger than c. So you get an a priori estimate, and so everything is F. In the, the general case, the estimate is you get something in which rho squared over sigma u is times e to the gamma h of u is controlled. And here you use the fact that e to the gamma h of u is larger than any power of u, so it's going to uh, eat, let's say, at infinity, this uh, quotient, no matter the values of uh, rho and uh, uh, p and q that you may have. OK. Uh, note that the solution is as uh, exponential summability, but we are not able to prove, so it is in every LS because h is a polynomial, but we cannot prove that u is, in, is bounded. If, however, both a and b do not depend on x. We can repeat the trick in the thermistor problem I showed you before. You get this equation after changing of variables. And now you use, again, the lower order term, u plus c squared, to prove that w, that is to say u, and that is to say c, are bounded functions. And so if a does not depend on u and if b on x and b does not depend on x, you get L infinity solutions. And it's clear, clearly, when you have L infinity solutions, you may have P positive, P negative, no matter what, Q positive or negative, because these are terms that do not degenerate, do not explode. So, and now in the last uh, three or four minutes, let me say what happens with when P is equal to Q minus one and when P is smaller than Q minus one. Okay, if P equal, then h is a log, of course. Uh, so that e to the gamma h is a power, again. So we have e to the gamma h, which is a power, e to the uh, rho of u, which is a power, sigma of u, which is a power. So the behavior now is comparable. Before it was an exponential of a polynomial, which was larger than any polynomial. And now you have polynomial, polynomial, or polynomial. So the problem here is that you have to make some, uh, some assumptions. For example, in the case before, the terms gamma minus something, you have no longer, uh, you are no longer free of choosing gamma small enough. And so we have some existence result in two cases. The first one, if p plus 1 is smaller than something depending on g. So for example, the larger is g, the smaller has to be p. And uh, here, p, which I remember is p plus 1, which is q in this case. Or, and the smaller is g, you can take q as large as you want. So either one, other p is small, other g is small. 
or as before, if A and B do not depend on X, because in this case, you make a change of variable and the behavior of rho and sigma becomes irrelevant because U is bounded. And so no matter what, uh, you have something which is uh, uh, strictly elliptical. And so you make, can make estimates uh, without any problem. Final case uh, is when P is uh, smaller than Q minus one. And this is really, really, really much more complicated. We do not have existence results, and but we have something that I want to show you to show why this, pro why this problem is very, very bad. So let us give an idea. You take A of X and T, the identity matrix times 1 plus T, plus T to the P, B, again, the identity. H is this function, which I said to you before, now is bounded because P minus Q minus q plus 1 is negative. So since it is bounded, even though you, you forget the dependence on, on x, the fact that e to the gamma h of u is in L1 is true. It is not in L1, it's in infinity. And so you cannot derive any information on u, on c, if you make this assumption. Then you cannot use the change of variable, because h of u okay, is bounded. Thank you very much. I knew it already. So you cannot, unless you know that uh, h of u, h of u is bounded by one over q minus p minus one. Either you prove that h of u is bounded by something which is strictly small, so that you, from this you can recover information on u. But if you say that h of u is smaller than forty-five, you have no information on u whatsoever. So the u uh, may be unbounded, but and now we make a final example is really, really much more prob problematic. And this is one of mathematically interesting point of view from the physical and the, our problem. The difference, I, one of the differences was that we had a lower order term plus u and plus c. The green one plus c, I told you, is used to make an estimate on c in L infinity. So mathematics, OK. Recall that if you want to pass from the elliptic to the parabolic semigroup theory, for example, lower order terms are good because those are the ones which approximate derivative in time, so you can use them. But what happens if they are not here? Do are we able under some assumption to prove something meaningful on the same the same problem? Well, one of the examples is Q is zero. And p smaller than one, more smaller than minus one, because recall that p is smaller than q minus one. Then in this case, first problem, no problem at all, because a of x on t is a constant, does not depend on u. You can take it's a power, so it does not depend on u. You have minus Laplace and psi plus, or you can remove it or not, equals g. Of course, there is existence of solution, but the two problems, if delta is minus p is larger than one, you have this problem. And this problem, if there is a lower order term, is something. For example, uh, Lucio Boccardo proved that with this term, this equation has at least a solution for every L1 data. So for example, for that C squared, while in a paper with uh, Albino, always Lucio Boccardo, uh, Enzo Verone, uh, Guido Trombetti in uh, 2003, we proved that the same equations, if delta is larger than one, has no solution even for L infinity data. Even if grad C squared is L infinity, then you have no solution for this problem. So the term plus u, somehow, if you even if you want to, you can study the problem with q equals zero and p smaller than minus one, but you to recover existence, you need to have the term plus u. Uh, OK, I will skip this, this final part. You can make a, a change of variables in the equation with plus u and find an equation, a semilinear equation with the lower order term, which has a vertical asymptote that forces you to have solutions. Otherwise, without the lower order term, if you make this change of solution, we might prove that you have a solution in the case uh, delta larger, larger than one, which is unbounded, so this is not the solution actually, on a set of positive measures. Okay, so I think I will uh, stop here.
thank you very much for the attention and thank you again for the invitation to speak here. Oh, thank you very much for wonderful lecture. Interesting, very interesting subject in the hard problem. <laughs> uh, let's see if, if he has some uh, remark or comments. But I have uh, only uh, uh, you, you uh, the, the, uh, the uh, exponents p in the q. Uh, uh, it could be negative. Yes. Yes. No. In the they could be negative, but with these assumptions, if p is larger than q minus one, so may be negative, but not very much negative with respect to q, then you may you you have existence of solution. So even in non elliptical cases, physical uh, physical I don't think it has a mm -hmm. meaning, but anyway. Uh -huh. And the uh, the power of the the quadratic there is a term uh, quadratic in gradient, yes. but uh, could it be uh, the power of a gradient could it be less than two? Okay, the 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 quadratic term in it's, the gradient of psi yeah. cannot be changed because you need the coupling between the two the two equations. Uh -huh. So you need to work out that you have psi squared on the on the right hand side because you have gradient psi. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it can be done something. If you want a different power on the right hand side, you have to put, let's say, power p, you have to put a p Laplacian in the second equation. But I advise you not to do that because it's going to be a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it, was a, uh, it was the next question uh, a version of p Laplacian. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. <laughs> the, the problem is that maybe you can. The problem is that you do not have a result of almost everywhere convergence of the gradients of the psi ends, mm -hmm. let's say. So mm -hmm. if the the operator the, sec, the operator in the second equation is nonlinear with respect to the, the gradient of psi, it's a nightmare to pass to the limit. So I think that if you want the gradient p on one side, you need the p Laplace on the other one, but you are not going to to find a meaningful uh, solution for the Pilaplacian equation. So uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a short, a very short blanket, let's say. If you, if you pull it on side, <laughs> your feet get uncovered somehow. Well, uh, congratulations for a very interesting problem. <laughs> Thank let's, you. Let's see if it's, there is uh, some question. I think not. Professor Sina, thank you very much for your... Thank you. Thank you again for, for listening and thank you again for the invitation. Okay. I, I you. wish you... Hopefully there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. I invite all the audience to continue with us in the afternoon section, which begin... 1.30. So, thank you very much. Enjoy the night. Bye.